Wine to Five is partially funded by Alborello Luxury Hand Soap, an unscented must-have accessory for anyone who loves wine, cooking, and food. For more information, visit alborellosoap.com. It's not five o'clock, and they don't care. Welcome to Wine to Five, entertainment, education, and everyday drinking for everyday people. Your hosts are Valerie Caruso and Stephanie Davis, two wine educators who don't need a clock to know when to pour that next glass. Welcome back to another episode of Wine 2-5. There is so much going on right now, so we're going to get right into it. But before we do... I want to see what our Steph has been up to in her trounces around central Italia. Steph, where you been? What are you seeing? What you drinking? What's going on over there? (laughs) (laughs) Well, uh, when it's not raining, we're enjoying all of the sights and the little little surrounding towns in Umbria. And yesterday spent the day in Gubbio and... I've been drinking a lot of Umbrian local wines. Uh, nothing fancy, but just enjoying uh, some vino bianco and, and vino rosso. And just, um, you know, just taking in all the sights and the beauty and the food and the rolling hills. And the uh, people have been so wonderful, even though it's not touristy here. You know, mm-hmm. they are very welcoming and I just can't, by the, some of these medieval castles and you know, these cool local, they have the local dialects and there's like local food and, you know, everything and just from town to town. So that's pretty special. That is so cool. I, I just, yeah. I love that you've got a little apartment out there and away from the town center and you're just, you know, living like a local. Yeah, we are trying, you know, I mean, Justin's better at the Italian than I am, but he says that when I drink more, I I speak it a little bit better, and it reminds me of you when you were saying that your friend was like, Val, you should just drink more. Yeah, you're you're fluent. <laughs> hey, when you're drunk, you're fluent. <laughs> I don't know if that's the case, or if you just feel like it is, or you think less, you have less inhibitions. I don't know what it is. I think it's the inhibitions, like you said, but I also, I told Justin that when I don't feel pressured Mm -hmm. to hurry up and come up with an answer. And conjugate the verbs. Yeah, exactly. If I don't overthink it, it usually comes out pretty good. And uh, so like at the end of the night when we, after we had gone to Antonello's dinner. Oh, yeah. Yes. It was so great. The D-Wine taste. Uh And... And uh, we went there, and five courses later, some really outstanding uh, Sicilian or Sicilia, right, Mm -hmm. Um, wines and food pairings. By the end of the night, the taxi driver that took us home, because we were so much farther than I thought, Val, Mm -hmm. you were like, I don't think you're staying anywhere near there and you were right i was wrong i was much (laughs) farther away but we the taxi driver i was i was busting out my italian man and justin's like you were really on it tonight and i was like i think it's because i've had a lot to drink (laughs) (laughs) those dinners are no joke and for the price oh my god you can't beat it oh my god i know and then when you stay there i remember staying there for like whatever the was the equivalent of it was like 45 euro or something to stay there Oh, that is a deal. Yeah, and the dinner was 30 euros and included yeah. all of the wine. Yeah. it's To me, it's like the best thing out there. Like, I wish I could just fly myself over once a month and go to one of his dinners. I mean, they're just... Mm-hmm. And the food's great. The wine's great. The conversation's great. And the little venue's adorable. You wake up and their breakfast the next day is ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, and they're, they're not too serious. Mm-mm. I mean, they're serious about wine, and they want you to learn, but they're not pretentious. Right. So it's the best of everything, and you were right about the glassware. I mean, they have everything just so. And I told Antonello that he really should charge more because it really is so good. And he yes. said, yeah, but he wants people to learn and not be intimidated, so it's important for him that the price is low. Right. He's spoiled me yeah he's spoiled he's really is doing such a great job and he's so cute because he's a software engineer yeah 
I mean, it's just a crack up. And he loves you. I was just like, I remember when Valerie, it's like, I remember when Valerie was here studying in Florence. And I mean, it was just like, it was like, you know, he totally had a flashback because I was like, oh, I'm friends with Valerie Caruso. And (laughs) I was like name dropping, you know, so it was cool. Love him. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, what is some of that uh bitching stuff you got in your glass today? Speaking ah, of all okay. these really great wines. Yes, well this is probably one of the best wines I've had since I've been here and even though it's not local, it's not in, from Umbria. Uh it came from Caterina and she just came to visit and so she brought a little hostess gift and it's a 2011 Campo Chiarenti, Chianti, Colli, Senesi. Yeah, Justin and I have always loved Chianti and uh, Tuscan wines. And so we had some of this. We were, I was sipping on it as my Wi-Fi was crashing earlier today. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, I had a, enough left for some pizza and uh the second attempt at the show, mm-hmm. <laughs> the Wi-Fi, but I love it. It's it's um, you know it's very classic, and even though it's not Chianti Classico Reserva, you know, I mean it is really beautiful. So thank you, Carina, and um, I'm enjoying it like you told me to. She was like, "Don't you don't have to open it now with me. Just enjoy it later." So I am. Thank you so much. Katerina was a guest on our show uh, quite a few episodes back. And That's right. she is the, she's Swedish, but she's uh, an excellent Italian speaker and translator. And so she's working in Florence now. She started her own business, remember? And and now she's doing the Tuesday, I think it's still Tuesday, live stream with Italian wines. And this was one of the live streams that she did was this uh Yes. Campo Chiarenti. And I think I was in that one. I can't remember. I was in a couple of her her when they were still blabs, which there's no more blab. Right. Yeah. So this is still the Tuesday um, and it's live stream. You can find it on Facebook. And she, uh, besides being a sommelier, she, you know, is doing the um, blogging. Mm-hmm. And that's at uh, grapevineadventures.com. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, she's meeting a lot of great italian producers and you know bringing some information to italy and and all over the world you know about what she's doing here in this country and then especially um in tuscany so i love it what are you what have you got over there val i'm still pulling from the samples that i was sipping back in june as i mentioned last week and actually posted a picture of what this looks like when I'm doing those insane tastings. And this bottle, I think, is actually in that picture. This is the 2013 uh, Catena Malbec from Catena Zapata family in Mendoza, Argentina, and actually just drained the bottle into my glass. I opened this, <laughs> you know, like I said, even though it was originally, I used the term violated because, you know, the Coravan, Coravan. Yeah, you know, punctures the cork. And I forgot to mention leaves an inert gas on top, which is heavier than oxygen, which prevents the wine from, you know, deteriorating. So this was one of them. And I opened it Sunday when I got back from uh, DC and just finished the bottle. And it's only Tuesday. There we go. <laughs> it's obviously a good bottle. It's about a, the sticker on it says $19.99. Well, and you know, Katena, I mean, it's such a great producer. It's how can you not like that Malbec? You can't you can't not like it. It's very it's got this really nice concentrated dark inky purple thing. I don't know if you can see it. You know, and it's got the beautiful like coconut. Mm. It's got a like a like a coconut nose and chocolate and it's jammy, but yet it's still got a nice acidity because this is a high altitude wine. Right. So it's from, like I said, Mendoza, uh, you're dealing with a little bit of altitude there. So you've got those cool evenings, you know, that cool air to balance out the warm, pure sunshine, that pure sunshine they have at that at that latitude. So uh, the wines down there are just gorgeous. I think Malbec really, really does shine in Argentina, I have to say. So this isn't this a nice little little wine to wash down some uh, spaghetti I had for lunch, you know, and <laughs> catching up on the voice while I was waiting for you to get your uh, internet back up. And so all caught up. <laughs> oh, you know what? I love it because you're watching the voice and we're watching SNL because we can't. <gasps> 
handle the hilarious Saturday Night Live. It's just so funny. Oh my god, this like... last one was the best. <laughs> oh my god, we were cracking up. We taped it because you know John and I can't stay up that late, so we have yeah. all the late night TV shows in the DVR, and this is what we're watching at night. All the all the fun they're making of this political. Oh shit my... show. I'm just gonna say it. God. It's a shit show. I mean, it is. so it, so the relief is what the late night people are doing to the. Uh, so I think the only reason we watch the debates is to take bets on what Saturday Night Live and Trevor Noah are gonna latch on to, you know, and they're yeah. making fun of them. I mean, really, because then you get the jokes more. Oh yeah, for for sure. And Justin's doing this hilarious Baldwin, you know. Uh, impersonation now i mean it's not like a trump impersonation now it's the baldwin impersonation and he was doing it last night at the restaurant when we were meeting jeremy parsons friend uh susan and so we had this whole you know it was like you know however many degrees of you know whatever it is and it's just so funny because i'm like val has connected me with so many people it is so crazy val like you have this web it just it's like goes every it's like the val web it's like i'm like a spider lady you know <laughs> it's so cool i'm like i really appreciate how many people you've connected me with and it's really neat and the world is really very connected in that wine community you know i was just gonna say wine really does bring people together i mean these people that you never met before like i met antonella on twitter yeah and i saw the dinner and i'd been i had been reading his uh dean wine taste for a few years because it was one of the recommended newsletters that our teacher in florence who's also named katarina she recommended and so i just started getting his newsletter back in 2009 and I was, you know, I'd been to Italy like two more times and I was there in 2011 and I saw it come across Twitter. I'm like, huh, I'm in Florence. I should just get on a train to Perugia and have, have dinner. I said, let me see if I can get some friends together. Well, my friends were all Italians with, you know, jobs. So they weren't going <laughs> to go down there for the night, you know. So I went down by myself and then you can read the story in my blog about how I had two tables for one. Um <laughs> And, and all that. It, but yet it turned out to be a Cinderella story. And I loved it. And so, and same with Katarina. I met her on Twitter. Right. Over wine. I mean, it's just, you know, hey, we're casually, oh, I've been there. I bro are you, do you work for Brolio? No, no. I was a history major and all this. And we just, know. you know, and, and you get to meet these people in person, which I think is so cool. It's so crazy because I was like, Katarina, I'm like, can't believe that we're meeting. And then we just met through Valerie. And she's like, and we just met through Twitter. And, and then, uh. Susan at dinner last night, she's like, so how do we all know each other? And how do you know Jeremy? And I was like, well, I only know Jeremy through Valerie. <laughs> Valerie knows Jeremy. You know, this whole thing. It's so crazy. Through blogging. And that was, we're talking seven years ago. Mm -hmm. we, somehow he made his way to my blog and I'd found his. And it, I think it's through another common blogger. I think it was through Sam Dugan. But yeah. it's, um, you know, we just somehow ended up in the same space. And then one day he had com commented on uh, something I was drinking from Pimante and, and I'd been following his blog and, you know, and just kind of throughout the wine world, this common interest in Italian wine. And yet I've never met him in person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But he's a, he's a super guy and he writes about French Accorto, which is one of my favorite bubblies. And, uh, and he was also a guest on the show. So how cool. It is so cool. It is so cool. And, you know, speaking of cool, it's now October. I know. I know. And it is beautiful. 60 degrees out. The leaves are changing. And you've seen those memes? No, I haven't. I haven't seen the memes. I'm, like, kind of, like, off the grid a little bit. I haven't seen the memes. Tell me about the memes. So the memes are all these beautiful shades of orange and gold and the trees changing. And they all say, October is my favorite color. Oh, yes, it is, though. I love orange. I know, orange is, and they use it for color therapy. I mean, orange is is one of those colors that makes you happy, you know? Yep. And so, yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I got my little orange, little pumpkin candle here. Was, I got like 12 of these around the house, you know, and they smell like pumpkin and, and cider. So when I think about this time of year, I know it's beautiful over there in Italy right now. It's harvest season. I'm reading all this stuff about harvest. I'm seeing all these pictures. In fact, I posted a huge collection of them on the Wine to Five Facebook page. Um, so I thought maybe we'd talk a little bit about 
harvest. Cool. Let's do it. And what's what's the deal? So yeah, yeah, totally. Because it's harvest in the northern hemisphere, right? Not Correct. in the southern hemisphere. So Correct. we have to clarify for all our other listeners who are like, it's not. I live in the southern hemisphere. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But that's right. So harvest usually begins late summer, around August. Val was mentioning that. And uh, the first grapes that get picked are really for the sparkling wines. And those grapes are picked uh, because they're lower sugar levels. And uh, they don't need to really be as ripe, right? And so they want to have the really high acidity. And uh, that's what makes sparkling wines great. So uh, that's happening already happened actually oh, yeah. Yeah. and now um because really you know we're, we're looking at mid-october now so thicker skinned red or black grapes are picked later like now and what we're referring to is like the petite verdot cabernet sauvignon you know some of those grapes mm-hmm. and not only do they need to develop their sugar levels spending more time in the sun and more time on the vine They need those sugar levels because that's what the yeast needs uh, to convert to alcohol. But they also need to develop their phenolic and tannic ripeness. That's very important. Mm -hmm. So besides the alcohol, I mean, you could have an alcohol bomb, but if, you know, they don't have the phenolic and, and all of that balance that we're looking for, they need all that in the skin. So if the grapes are picked too early, no doubt you've, had a wine where the tannins are just super aggressive the wine can be pretty rough if they aren't allowed to soften during the ripening process that's not any good for the rest of us who are drinking the wine so Mm -hmm. um this is this is important because you know it all it all comes together when you've got the the aging and all of the the ripeness and uh everything comes together at the very end for these red wines but it's different it's totally different scenario for the sparkling wines and the white wines so mm-hmm. um but here's a little factoid for you guys anthocyanins are what give the black grapes their color and during ripening these increase as the chlorophyll levels in the grapes chlorophyll being the green part decreases so that's kind of a cool little factoid I'm just kind of sandwich that in there absolutely and it's funny because the um, the low anthocyanin, there's a pH relationship too, and we're not going to go into that. We're not going to go into no. pH levels with the blue versus the lighter red wines and the malic and the tartaric acids and potassium has to do with all of this. But yeah. there are other things that come into play too. So we're, we're, we're kind of simplifying a bit. But when we talk about harvest, weather is a biggie. Mm-hmm. Weather is a big flipping deal. Not only do growers have to worry about weather at harvest this time of year, for example, picking late in the season under rainy skies can be devastating. Remember, I it always is. talk about 2011 when Napa had like, what, 20 straight days of rain or something like that. And the Cabernet, that late ripening grape was still mm-hmm. one of the last ones on the vine and people were worried that, oh my God, they're going to be all diluted or they can get moldy. That's and right. This can, yeah, this can ruin your harvest. So... So they're worrying about weather during harvest. They're watching the skies. But also, so you've got way back in the spring with the, uh, like a late spring frost. So the grapes Mm -hmm. haven't even developed yet. But if they're just budding, that frost can kill, you know, those buds. Or if the grapes are flowering or, or, you know, just starting to have fruit set, that can also ruin as well. Just like an early frost in the fall can ruin the grapes. Yeah, and I think sometimes people don't realize, you know, how much wine is just like in your own garden at home. Right. Think about that. You get the hail, you get frost, and then all of a sudden you're like, all that work for nothing. You know? Yeah, my tomatoes were shredded by hail, you know, for yeah. example. And not only do they destroy the fruit, and they, you know, they destroy the the fruit itself, like thinking of the, the grapes, but then mm-hmm. they can shred the canopy, all those leaves. Well, yeah. then that ruins the grape's ability to process, you know, mm-hmm. to create, the, you know, this photosynthesis as well. And... Mm-hmm. It can really just take out a vineyard. And that happened uh, this year, like over in Burgundy and in many places around the world. So summer hail Mm -hmm. is a threat. You know, there are other things, too. Uh, 
pests and disease, mildew. Bugs can bring certain things or pests can transmit certain disease, like Pierce's disease can be transmitted by the glossy wing sharpshooter and California's dealing with that. Mm-hmm. And then even pests you wouldn't think about. And I thought this was fun to toss this in there, but a few years back, and I, I, I have the article and I'm going to link it up for you guys, but I remember seeing photos of baboons eating grapes in South Africa. Ew, and I would doubt it. Those baboons are like crazy. They're crazy. I mean, you can see where they're like stealing people's pizzas and out of the, they'll <laughs> open your car doors. They do. They're a problem <laughs> and they're violent and, and they're a problem because people are encroaching on spaces that they've lived in for so long. So they're a problem in the vineyard as well because they've got the electric fences. But here's what some of the winemakers have told us these baboons do. They'll mm-hmm. throw the baby baboons onto the electric fence to see if the baby screams. Right? I can't and if believe the, it. I yeah, can't they do. That. They, they, they know this. They're tactical, man. And so if the if the baby baboon <laughs> screams, then they mean, okay, well, that electric fence means business. We're not supposed to go mess with it. But if he does a scream, then it's grape on. I mean, they go on in. And so I'll link up this piece from the LA Times blog. It was from back in 2010. It's called Baboons, the Wine Connoisseurs of the Animal Kingdom. And can anyone guess what grapes these baboons prefer? I have no idea. I'm just like, this is hilarious. But it's not if you're a winemaker over there. It's not. I mean, this is a problem and they're not allowed to shoot them. Only a few. There, we did visit one winemaker, and I, I think it might have been Hamilton Russell, but don't quote me on that. But one of them, I think, does have a license to shoot them. And I'm not sure which one it is. I, I can't remember off the top of my head. But but they wow. they they do like grapes. Guess which ones? Pinotage. Um, Pinot Noir oh. and Chardonnay. Uh, oh my God. So these are classy baboons. These are classy baboons. Yes. They have a thing for Chardonnay and a good Pinot. So that is hilarious. I yeah. love it. I love it. Well, okay. So Pinot and Chardonnay. You might also remember these are the grapes that are featured in Burgundy. And we've mm-hmm. been talking about these over mm-hmm. the last couple of episodes. So speaking of Burgundy, this plays into our wino radar. So check this out. And Val even was like, you've got to check this out. And then I was I was reading it. It's like, what? Oh, my gosh. Like, I crazy town. Right. But anyway, right. so you know, right? So after Burgundy has suffered so many things, frost, hail, mildew, locusts, frogs, and the plague. No, no, no. Okay, we're just kidding. <laughs> the last three, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, they really have had frost, hail, mildew. And uh, according to another article in Decanter, which we'll have linked up for you guys, every grape counts, as this was the worst harvest since 1981. I'm actually really, like, I I think that is a big deal. You know, I mean, in somewhere between 20 and 27% less grapes than last year i mean they they are having a hard time so we are going to see prices rise for sure Mm -hmm. but grapes are now being stolen but besides all these other things Mm -hmm. and not by the baboons right they don't even have baboons no so i I mean besides all these other things that these winemakers have to worry about they got to worry about somebody coming and picking their damn grapes at night i can't believe that i mean it's like it's like who does that? No, and who does and who does it successfully? I mean, it's just like how do they There's probably going to be some new like crime movie like some what is it like uh you know, some Matt Damon wine thief movie. <laughs> well, you know, and and I'm going to I'm going to jump ahead because you know, apparently I get that people might sneak in and pick at night. You know, and this isn't the first time this has happened. I mean, right. this happened no, last hasn't. year yeah. with the uh, with that Condru. Yeah, I think it was. And yeah, the in the oh yeah, it was in the Rhone. The Maison Etienne Guigal had a third of their premium Viognier grapes stolen that were reserved for their famous luminescence last year. And oh, by the way, that luminescence was only made like two other years, ninety nine and two thousand three. But here's the kicker, and I'm going to just jump ahead here because in okay. 2010. Also the year of the baboons. In the Languedoc Roussillon, there was a producer that literally had folks come in at night with a mechanical harvester and rip off 30 tons of Cabernet Sauvignon with a mechanical harvester. I think this is Hollywood worthy. I think they should have some new, like, you know, movie. 
And they're, they're getting away with this. And I'm like, how? How do you have a mechanical harvester in your vineyards at night and not hear it? Yeah, or know it this? Like how, if they, like, how could they operate it without any lights on? Or, I mean, it's like they've got to see, which means then they would be drawing attention to the, themselves. I don't, even, I don't even, it doesn't even make sense to me. Well, apparently these vineyards were an isolated spot. They're a couple kilometers from the village, and they're down by the river. So nobody was around to see this. And maybe they're using night vision goggles. I don't know. You know, I could, I'm could. i just trying to I'm trying to picture these guys in the fields of Burgundy. And, you know, and they're stealing, like, what, 40,000 euros worth of wine, you know? Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying, or these grapes. So and I'm ballsy. trying to picture these guys in, like, tactical gear and NBGs, <laughs> night vision goggles or nods. And, you know, maybe wearing Kevlar. I don't know. But I'm like, what? what? So, right. I don't know, baboons or crooks what i mean what so i don't know i don't know but you know what i think it's kind of it is cool to bring this this stuff to light because you know there's a lot of people just who have no idea you know and, and me included at times you're like why is this so expensive this bottle or what's so special about this vintage and you know there's like wine has so much more of a story I mean, seriously, this, there is so much more of a story here mm-hmm. than, than gin. And, and God, I love gin. I did have that monkey gin finally last oh, night. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, Ger- uh, it's German, I believe. The German one that mm-hmm. I think Karen McNeil talked about. Was it Karen, I think? Mm-hmm. Oh, my gosh. Anyway, more on that some other time. But, I mean, it's like, we're not talking about beer. We're not talking about gin or vodka. We're talking about baboons that eat the wine grapes you know this is a big deal people who are stealing the these precious grapes i mean it's like they gotta wait a whole nother year to grow these grapes this is crazy well and then if you look back also at that gigal you know even though a third of their premium grapes were stolen I mean, the good news is is that the other two thirds of the grapes were in really great shape. So if they made the uh, the luminescence in 2015, then now you know the story behind that bottle, and and it's it is such a rare wine. Remember, it was only made in two other prior years. So mm-hmm. there would be a really good story behind that, and I think that's that's what I like about wine. So I'm sure some of you may have turned us off already when you heard us either babbling in the beginning or talking about harvest, because you're probably like, who cares? <laughs> But these are the kind of things that you have to worry about as a winemaker. And when people say, oh, Val, don't you want to own a vineyard someday? No. No. I'm not a farmer. This is agriculture, man. I said, I get bajiggity when the deer are out there eating my hydrangeas every night, you know? And the rabbit ate my hostas. I didn't even get hostas this year because the rabbit just chowed chowed down on all of them. And we watched him do it, you know? And, And I'm just like, I couldn't have a vineyard. I would break out in hives. No, I know I lost one plant in my garden this year. I lost uh-huh. one plant. And I was really bent in our shape about it. I mean, it was, just like, yeah. it was like a mystery. I'm like, what happened to this one plant? I think it was sick or diseased and I did everything right and all the other plants are great. And I'm like, son of a gun. This is ridiculous. I spent good money on this plant. <laughs> There's no way I could have a vineyard. Yeah. No, no. But it is that time of year. And, and you know, we just got to send some shout outs and love to all the people that do this so we can have wine. You know what I'm That's saying? Right. That's right. Let's give so. a cheers. Cheers, girl. Dude. Clink. <laughs> <laughs> Clink. Mm. Oh, my gosh. Well, so should we jump into the factoid since we've been mm-hmm. going on? All right. Let's do it. So, this is an interesting little factoid from Oz Clark's The History of Wine in a Hundred Bottles, from Bacchus to Bordeaux and beyond. Did you know that when Madeira was imported into the major port cities like Savannah and Charleston in the United States prior to the Civil War, that Americans at that time were actually the world's greatest Madeira connoisseurs? And you're probably thinking, like, what? You know, dating back to the 1660s, about the time these ports were were generally set up, the blind-tasting party trick at that time was not only to identify the wine, but to identify the actual ship the wine came in on. No, that's just, just like, beyond wine. Right? Yeah, that's beyond blind-tasting. And you're probably all wondering, like, how would you know what ship 
a wine came in on? I mean, what would give you these clues? And the reason for this is the ships varied in their routes and the amount of traveling across the Atlantic. So each wine could actually be tied, tied to an individual ship. And this information can be verified by looking at the ship's log. So some ships may have taken a little bit longer, took a longer trip, or maybe around through the tropics, you know, down into the Caribbean, and that wine would have oxidized a lot more. And so instead of looking at, you know, the types of grapes and the styles, because, you know, Madeira has the different styles, the Cercial, the Boal, the Verdeo, and the Malmsey, all defined by grapes and styles. That's right. But knowing that it came floating in, you know, came floating on in from the Trow Bridge or whatever ships were docking during that time. Can you imagine if blind tasting papers or exams were being graded like this today? Yeah, I mean, that's uh, that's a really nice con for you, but, you know, what model tractor did they use to harvest? <laughs> you know, what's funny to think about it, too, is to combine that kind of um, blind tasting trivia with, like, modern day um, apps so, like, let's say there's, like, an app on your phone that's like, okay, and this wine, guess where this wine, you know, traveled to, and how many times it crossed the equator, yeah. and what ship it was on, and, you know, which islands it stopped and docked at. I mean, it was, it, that's just hilarious. I know, and it that, that is, it is hilarious, and apparently, like I said, you know, our blind tasting skills are nothing compared to that, but can, you know, we were talking about the Linné Aquavit and how it rides around on a ship for aging because oh, yeah. they don't have the warehouse space. Yeah. Do you want, do you know if anyone can actually taste uh, which ship the Aquavit rides around on? Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure, no. I don't think there's <laughs> anyone, <laughs> I don't think anyone would go there, but I think it's a funny thing to think about. I mean... Yeah, it's just, yeah. it's just crazy. But I love Madeira, so I appreciate that you put that in our little factoid there. I mean, I don't drink enough Madeira, and I, I think I probably, you know, if I like, if I like, you know, had another lifetime, I probably, you know, was there in the beginning of, you know, the American Revolution, and I was probably drinking a lot of Madeira because it has like a special place in my heart. It really does have a special place in my heart, too. And here's, a, here's just another little factoid that a lot of people don't realize about Madeira. It's already been oxidized all to heck. Yeah. It's practically been cooked. Or as my wine teacher in Italy used to say, it has been cooked. But um, <laughs> yes, it was so cute. It's been cooked. So the wine's been cooked, practically. You can't do anything to kill this wine. You can't just say, oh, it's going to get oxidized because it already is. You That's know, right. especially if you're looking at a Malmsey, you know, or something like that, you know. So it's not one of those must-drink situations. Maybe the lighter styles, the Cercial and the Verdejo, you know, those might be a little bit more in a chill, must-drink situation. But when you get into the, the styles that have been more heavily oxidized, oh my gosh, you can't do yeah. anything. You can leave them open, you know. I'm not going to say forever, but you can leave them open for quite a while. And so That's they're right. a nice thing to have for a soup dish, a nice crab or lobster bisque, mm -hmm. you know, all the way through dessert. I mean, just, I just love Madeira. I do too. I, for a while there, I was just kind of having it as sort of like a late afternoon aperitivo with some nuts or like a yeah. aged cheese or something like that. And yeah, it's yeah. nice to have some of that around because you don't have to worry about consuming the full bottle within, you know, some kind of freshness period. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it is what it is, you know, it's yeah. just, that's nice. Well, should we move on to Wine or Radar? Well, we should. We've kind of like strolled through Harvest and into Madeira and ships and let's just move on into Wine or Radar. And what <laughs> do you have for us? We'll cruise on over to Wine or Radar. Cruise uh, on so, over. Yeah. You know, because I had Katarina with me, I thought it would be cool if she could share uh, something with our listeners about what she's up to and promoting. So let's listen to Katarina's announcement. So I'm here with Katarina Anderson, and she's going to tell us about her event coming up. Okay, thank you. So it's an event uh, called Vinoir, which means uh, wine is. So you can add like wine is culture, wine is tradition, wine is to be social uh, or any other thing. And it's in Florence, in Italy. 
Uh, it's an event organized by FISA, which is one of the um, Italian national sommelier associations. And it's going to be at the 12th and 13th of November 2016 this year. Um, there's going to be two days of of the wine tasting, so you can taste wines from around 100 producers, smaller producers. And there's going to be eight vertical wine tastings. Uh, for example, uh, wine from uh, different vintages of uh, Quintarelli, Amarola di Valpolicella, uh, or like uh, sparkling wines, Trento Doc from Ferrari. Uh, they're going to do wines in amphora uh, wow. demonstration. And there's going to be cooking shows or cooking demonstrations with local chefs. And there's going to be a fashion show with the male sommeliers <laughs> <laughs> who are going to wear uh, design tablecloths uh, from a local design company. And there's going to be then an uh, award to the most voted male sommelier. Oh, <laughs> that sounds good. And uh, so it's going on for two days, and uh, it's in the center of Florence, uh, Stazione Leopolda. And I think it's a great event to attend because it's a way for FISA to uh, get more visibility and to appeal to a larger audience or people in general. So it's open for everybody, not only for the members. And you can go there both days or only one day as you like. And the inauguration is already on the 11th in the evening. But the event only starts the day after. And you can buy tickets online? Yes, you can buy tickets online on the site uh, www.vinoe.it. Uh, and you can also buy them at the door if you want that. Perfect. All right. Looking forward to that. Thank you, Katarina. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, did she say male sommeliers wearing designer tablecloths? <laughs> yeah. She really said that? I was, yeah, I she really sure said that. About- and there's a um, contest like, who's the best one? <laughs> yes, please. That makes that whole... Remember back, was it last year, they had... Uh, Penfolds does this. This is Dylan Proctor's thing where they have the best dress psalm. The yes, GQ right. magazine thing. Yeah. Oh, my God. I know. We should totally submit some of these Fizar sommeliers over in Italy. This is this is a, a branch of a sommelier over there. They have the AIS and they got the Fizar. And... These guys wearing designer tablecloths. <laughs> I, I, don't, I can't even fathom. I can't I even fathom, know. but I want to see it, and I really want to book a, a ticket and get over there for this. Um, yeah, but you can, we're going to link up the website for you. It's vinoe, V-I-N-O-E dot I-T, and that means wine is, vinoe, wine is. And uh, and we can stalk them on Twitter too. We've been doing that. So Vino A Fizar, V I N O E F I S A R, and you can stalk them on Twitter. And good God, I hope they post pictures of these male sommeliers wearing tablecloths. <laughs> when she said that, I was like, "Wow, this is a whole new game now." Is this? Yeah. <laughs> when yeah. are they going to start doing this in the U.S.? Hey, maybe the We Like Drinking guys should start thinking about that. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, 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 I don't even know what to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Jeff Solomon, if you're out there, dude. Oh, my God. Okay, we are oh moving on to our Patreon love. I think this is a good segue, don't very you good. think? Patreon very love. Good. Little tablecloth table love. Well, I don't know what you're doing over there in Umbria, but um, you go, girl. <laughs> okay. Okay, okay, so thank you guys so much. Thank you to our Patreon supporters. We are giving you some love. So to our tenacious tasters, you are just as dedicated to our Wine to Five podcast as you are to your adult beverage, wine, or otherwise. We appreciate your tenacity. Jeffy, we're talking about you, man. And your hilarious show that we were just talking about. We like drinking. This is totally about you. Thank you so much. And to our It's Not 5 O'Clock and We Don't Care listeners, which I have said it's not 5 o'clock and I don't care a few times (laughs) already this trip, you guys 
Thank you so much. You want your podcast when you want it and your wine when you want it. Nobody's going to tell you when it's time to pull that cork. So thank you, Meg from South Dakota, Clay from Arizona, and grazie mille to John from California. You guys, you're making it happen for us. Thank you so much. So speaking of Patreon, if you don't know already from the pictures on our Facebook we have some Wine 25 Govino logo glasses, and we're shipping them out to people who are supporting us mm-hmm. on Patreon. So they're not for sale, but you can get them by heading over to www.patreon.com forward slash Wine 25 podcast. And if you pledge $5 a month, you'll get one glass, $10 a month. A set of two glasses, or for twenty dollars a month, you get four glasses. That's, That's pretty awesome. That's how you do it. Now you get your wine to five yeah. glasses. Our show would not be possible without you, our listener community. To find out more about how you can support Wine to Five Show, please go to patreon.com wine to five podcast. This brings us to the end of our show. We hope that you'll share Wine to Five with your friends and online community. We certainly appreciate all your involvement, all your feedback. You can leave us a burning wine question or comment on SpeakPipe. And while you're at it, please go to iTunes and show us some love there in the form of a glowing iTunes review. We like five stars. We hope we're giving you five-star entertainment. And we're also on iHeartRadio, so put us on your playlist there if that's the, uh, the podcast player of choice for you. You can also, please, 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 share our fun Wine to Five community because what good is wine if you don't share it? So all the wine lovers in your life, they deserve to hear about Wine to Five as well. Right. And you can connect with us. You can connect with Val on Twitter at Wine Gal and Voxed and on the Vino with Val Facebook page and on Instagram, it's Vino with Val. And you can find me on Twitter at Alberello Soap and on the Alberello Soap Facebook page and the Alberello YouTube channel. I'm also on Instagram too as the wine heroine but you can visit us on the wine t-w-o-f-i-v-e.com website and please interact with us on facebook twitter pinterest youtube and google plus and we do have a lot of cool stuff on our wine to five online store so check that out too we have books accessories all the things that we talk about on the show that you're like, when I'm not driving, I will go check that out. So that's what we hope you do. And one more thing, we have our fourth quarter hashtag W25 challenge going on. So anytime you're trying new wines, drinks, anything that's cool and you want to share it, get it up there on social media. You will be entered into our drawing and co-host a show with us if you win. So, until next week, Val, cheers. Cheers. Salute. Salute. Thank you for listening to the Wine to Five podcast. Be sure to check us out at Facebook slash Wine T-W-O 5. And tune in next week for more fun and useful sip tips.